begin, not to waste any time at all. So I'd like to make a warm welcome to Ajahn Brahmali, who's joining us from Vodhinyana Monastery, as you can see. And it's a great privilege and delight to have you here, Ajahn Brahmali. Um, so we're going to have a Dhamma talk today. We'll start with a few minutes, a quiet meditation, and then a Dhamma talk, and an opportunity to ask questions towards the end. Um, and we will ask you to send your questions to Derek. He has the prefix before his name, Q and A. So Q and A Derek, who's one of our co-hosts. If you send your questions, please only to him and he will relay them back to me and I'll put them to Ajahn Brahmali for you. That will help us organize it. So uh, until then, you can really just sit back and relax. So I wanted to introduce Ajahn Brahmali to anyone who is not aware of who he is, which most of you probably are. So born in Norway in 1964, Ajahn Brahmali felt a strong calling to Buddhism and meditation in his early 20s after a visit to Japan. Having completed master's degrees in engineering and finance, he began his monastic training as an Anagarika in England at Amaravati and Chithurst Buddhist monasteries. In 1994, after hearing a teaching by Ajahn Brahm, he moved to Australia to train in Bodhinyana Monastery. He took full ordination as a bhikkhu with Ajahn Brahm as preceptor in 1996 and has now been a monk for 24 years. That's, that's an old one. That, that's an old Sorry? one. <laughs> that biography is already out of date. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Carry on, Venerable. <Benibble>. Sorry. <laughs> okay, no worries. <laughs> Ajahn Brahmali is a powerfully effective teacher of meditation who draws his inspiration primarily from the early Buddhist texts as well as from Ajahn Brahm, of course. He also teaches Pali language and the monastic training rules to monks at Bodhinyana and to bhikkhunis at Dhammasara Nons Monastery, as well as overseas. You've been teaching Vinaya to some of the Thai bhikkhunis, I believe, Ajahn. Hmm. His lucidly inspiring talks bring the Buddha's teachings alive and are very popular downloads on the BSWA YouTube channel. Ajahn Brahmali also played an instrumental role in the first Theravada Bhikkhuni ordinations in Perth in 2009. That's the first um, Bhikkhuni ordinations in the Thai forest tradition at least, and is a much sought after teacher internationally. So we're very grateful to have you with us Ajahn and um, we'll hand over to you whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you. I have a slight technical problem here, but I'll get it okay. sorted out. Yeah, okay, now I'm sorted. Okay, everyone. Uh, hello again. Nice to see you all. Uh, and uh, so this is marvelous that we can meet in this way over the internet. It's really great. Yeah, technology is useful. Sometimes technology is really harmful. Sometimes it's really useful. Uh, and now, right now, I think it's really marvelous. So uh, let's start by doing some uh, brief meditation together just to relax a little bit and just uh, bring up some mindfulness, uh, just to kind of be ready for the, uh, the rest of the uh, what is it for me? It's evening. For the, for the many of you, it's midday. But whatever it is, we we'll just uh, start with a bit of meditation. Huh? So sit back, relax, uh, close your eyes, uh, and just start by uh, feeling your body to make sure that you are at ease, that you are relaxed, that you are comfortable, so you can allow the mind just to rest and just uh, gradually fall to peace.
And uh, instead of thinking of yourself as a meditator who is doing meditation, uh, just don't think in those terms at all. Uh, because once you have an idea of something, uh, you tend to do too much uh, because you tend to do your meditation practice. Uh, instead, just learn to relax and don't really do anything. Uh, allow the mind to float, allow the mind to be whatever it wants to be. Uh, because otherwise you won't be able to relax properly. You won't be able to rest the mind properly. Yeah. So just sit back yeah, as if you're just resting in a nice chair, yeah, not doing anything at all, and just allowing the mind gradually, gradually yeah, to settle down by itself. Yeah. And uh, as you allow your mind just to relax, uh, sometimes you just need to nudge it very gently, uh, just to remind yourself to look for the peace in your meditation. Uh, and whenever you do sit down, you will see that there is a degree of peace there as well in between the thinking or whatever. Uh, and just notice that peace. Uh, and as you focus on the peace and you enjoy it, uh, just allow it very slowly to expand in your mind. Uh, it's automatic. Uh, as long as you enjoy the peace, uh, it will expand by itself. Uh.
Okay, everyone. So uh, uh, that's the end of the meditation for now. So please come out. Uh, Okay, so um, uh, let's start the talk, I suppose. And the uh, uh, subject for the talk today, suggested by Venerable Chanda, is uh, the view that frees. Uh, yeah, sounds really cool. Sounds like a nice name for a Dhamma talk, I reckon. And, uh, and it's a very interesting subject because uh, the idea of freeing is itself is a very gradual thing yeah it's something that happens gradually over time sometimes when we uh, think about the view that frees we might think about uh, things like stream entry or enlightenment and that sort of thing yeah when finally bang the big view comes up uh, you get insight into reality uh, and you see things in a brand new way that's the view that frees uh. but uh, the reality about views is that they develop gradually yeah a view is something that kind of comes gradually and this is one of the very important aspects of this path uh, is actually to understand how to develop the right view gradually during your practice and as you do that uh, it will influence your path from the very beginning to the very end so one way of thinking about the buddhist path is thinking about it as development of view yeah the change gradual changing of view from the beginning to the very end of the path. Uh, that's one way of thinking about it. Uh, um, to give you an example of the power of right view, I will uh, just tell you about something that happened here during the rains retreat, because we have we finished the rains retreat here, what is it now, three months ago, three and a half months ago, something like that. Uh, and uh, one of the questions that often comes up during these rains retreats uh, is people ask, they say, well, you know, the way Ajahn Brahm teaches meditation practice, yeah, Ajahn Brahm says, oh, just relax, yeah, sit back, don't do anything, just chill, you know, just or have the, you know, and just kind of allow the whole process to happen, yeah, that's what, that's what Ajahn Brahm says, uh, and then people get really frustrated, and they come to me, yeah, it's really unfair, they come to me, and they want to sort out the things that Ajahn Brahm says, uh, and they say to me, well, I, I do exactly what Ajahn Brahm says, I just relax, and what happens? I fall asleep, yeah, or I think all the time, my mind goes in kind of haywire and thinks about the past and the future and about problems and about work I have to do and everything in between, all the pleasures I'm going to enjoy when I get back home from this blooming retreat, yeah, eight precepts, too many precepts, uh, I want to, <laughs> etc, etc, and so they ask me, why is it uh, that when I follow all the instructions, uh, I really just relax, I really enjoy myself, uh, how come nothing happens? Uh, Ajahn Brahm says that when he just sits back and relaxes, yeah, what happens is that he goes peaceful, his mind goes empty, nimittas come up, bing, yeah, and then he bang on the way into deep meditation. That's kind of the Ajahn Brahm way of doing things. Why doesn't it happen to me? How come I fall asleep instead? And it is a very interesting question, yeah, it's actually very, very interesting. Why is it that seemingly the same instruction uh, works really well for one person does not work for another person what is actually going on here if we can crack this if we can understand why why it works for one person not for another then we have kind of cracked the code of buddhist meditation yeah we know what we need to do to make meditation work so what i told people i said the reason why it works for Ajahn Brahm, but not for you is because your mind is not inclining in the right way that is the reason why it doesn't work. Yeah, so what does that mean? It means that if you just relax and your mind is not inclining in the right way, it means that your mind will incline to thoughts, yeah, because that's what you are interested in. Or if you are kind of bored, the mind will incline maybe to tiredness and you fall asleep. The mind will incline to whatever it is interested in. That's where the mind always goes. Automatically, it goes to what is interesting to it. So the difference is the inclination of mind. That is why it works for one person, not for another one. So if you just relax, yeah, don't do anything, and your mind naturally inclines to peace, then the, that is where the mind goes, because you're just relaxing. Yeah? But if you just relax, don't do anything, and your mind naturally in, you know, 
uh, you know, moves towards food or, or whatever it is. Yeah. Oh, I want like a nice meal or whatever. Then, of course, that's where the mind goes. Yeah. So the inclination of the mind is the critical one. Huh? And then what happened? I, I gave this answer. And of course, people say, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, you know, they're never 100 percent satisfied with the answer, which is fair enough. Yeah, of course, you should never be 100 percent satisfied. You should always think for yourself. And I'm really glad people do that. So they went to Ajahn Brahm and said, oh, Ajahn Brahmali says this. Yeah, what do you say here? <laughs> and uh, Ajahn Brahm said, well, the, the reason why what I do in my meditation, yeah, what I do is that I, when I sit down, I incline the mind towards renunciation. That's what he said. Yeah. And when you think about it, the idea of inclining towards peace and inclining towards renunciation are actually very, very similar things. Uh, because the things that you renounce uh, are exactly the same things that stop you from becoming peaceful. Yeah? So it's a very similar kind of idea. Or if you know where peace is to be found, you incline it towards peace, you automatically renounce because those things that don't lead to peace, you're not interested in them, so you let them go. Uh, it's an automatic process. Uh, so these two things have a lot in common, yeah? the idea of moving towards peace or inclining the mind to renunciation. But why is it that some people's mind incline in this way? Why is it that Ajahn Brahm's mind incl inclines towards renunciation, towards giving up? And why is it that some people's minds don't incline that way? What is the common thread underlying all of this? And the common thread that underlines all of this is right view, or if you wish, wrong view. So if you have right view, if you look at the world in the right way, if you think about life, the world, everything in the right way, you will automatically, and this is kind of aligned with the way the Buddha saw things, automatically your mind will move towards peace and renunciation. Why? Because you're just giving up dukkha, you're just giving up suffering. Everyone wants to give up suffering. It's just bleeding obvious, yeah? Who wants to hold on to suffering? So you give up the terrible suffering and you move towards happiness. But if you have wrong view, then you think that those things that actually are suffering, you think that they are happiness. And so you incline there because everyone wants to be happy. You incline according to your delusion, according to your wrong view. So you incline towards, oh, this wonderful dinner I'm going to have when I get off this meditation course or this wonderful entertainment I'm going to uh, you know, do or oh, all these problems at work and got to solve. Yeah, well, now my mind is feeling a little bit more clear. Now is the time to solve those problems. No, now is not the time. Yeah, keep on relaxing, keep on enjoying the meditation. Later on, come back to these problems. So, so this is the underlying problem, is the idea of right view. It underlies the entire process of meditation. Get it right, and your meditation is going to be very, very powerful. And it's fascinating. One of the things that I noticed in the suttas, the suttas are the word of the Buddha, for those of you who might not know. And one of the things I noticed a while ago is that uh, Satipatthana practice. Yes, Satipatthana is one of those fundamental words you will hear and hear about in Buddhist meditation all the time. Satipatthana means like the establishment of mindfulness. It is all about the Buddhist kind of meditation, if you like. And one of the things I noticed fairly early on is that Buddhist meditation, Satipatthana, is founded on two things. Yeah, and those two things are virtue, morality. So you have to, you should really be on a good kind of living well before you start practicing too much, otherwise you might get into trouble. And the other one is right view, Ujjukaditi, straight view. Yeah, and uh, it starts to become clear. This is exactly why some people are successful and others are not. So then the question arises, how can we ensure that our view becomes right, yeah? So that we can enhance our meditation practice. If we can get that right view, your meditation is gonna be far, far more powerful. Uh, so this is one of the things I want to cover tonight, uh, uh, today, whatever, it, uh, it's always dangerous when you talk across time zones, but whatever it is, yeah? So <laughs> for me, it is tonight, but um, so, to do this, I want to come back to the very basic ideas of right view. I want to start at the beginning. And uh, if you, uh, you know your suttas a little bit, some of you will know the teachings of the Buddha quite well. And you will know that on the Noble Eightfold Path, yeah, which is the practice that leads to awakening or enlightenment or arahantship or whatever you want to call it, uh, 
on that path, the first factor is right here. It starts there, yeah? So what that means is because that is the first factor and then the subsequent factors are the factors of morality, there are the factors of a right effort, which is like a deeper kind of morality, if you like, yeah. factors of meditation, samma sati, satipatthana, right meditation, and lastly, the factor of stillness, of deep meditation. All of these things are founded on right view. That is the foundation for all of these things. Yeah. So um, uh, what that means is that even your morality, your ability to practice good moral conduct in the end depends on right view. Yeah. So if you want to practice your morality well, establish more right view. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? Because sometimes we try very hard to be moral. We try really, we, we kind of say, yeah, I got to, you know, get, you get this, um, uh, you, you know, at New Year, you take, you take on some of these, uh, you, you know, you decide you're going to be more moral or whatever, and you can't really do it for some reason. And the reason you can't do it is because even though you strive and you put in the willpower and do all of these things that maybe ideally you should not, uh, the problem is that your view is perhaps not strong enough, yeah, not enough right view. That might, in fact, be the problem, even for morality. So that is where it starts. Yeah, it starts with helping out in your morality. Then it moves on into your mental sphere, how to deal with your mind. And then it goes on to the meditation practice. And ultimately, it comes to this uh, Venerable Chanda's idea of the view that frees big time, yeah, the big time freeing view. And that is, of course, where you become enlightened down the track, but way long time before we reach that point. Uh, right view already is very, very powerful and very effective. Yeah? So what is that right view? And um, uh, you may know that the way right view is often defined in the suttas, it is defined as a, an understanding of the four noble truths. Yeah. So the four noble truths are obviously the noble truth of suffering, the origin of suffering, the end of suffering, and the path that leads to the end of suffering. Yeah? And of those, the most important one initially is probably the first one, the noble truth of suffering here, because that gives us guidance on where to look for happiness in the world and where to, what to avoid it, because it is problematic. Yeah? And uh, one of the ways that this is often taught is often taught in terms of kamma and rebirth. Yeah, you make bad kamma, you get bad results, you might get a bad rebirth or good kamma, and good rebirth and all of that. Uh, but um, one of the simple ways, and this is the thing I teach all the time when I teach meditation retreats, one of, one of the most simple ways of thinking about kamma is to think about kamma as something that happens within this particular life. Because if you think about it as something that happens within this life, it means that you can actually tell whether you're making good karma or not. Yeah, it is not some mysterious force that kind of takes you from one life to the next one. It's something you can monitor within yourself. And that is very useful. If you can see things, it leads to far more confidence and faith that there's something to this. So what I would re really recommend you to do is to look at yourself when you do an act of kindness towards somebody. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure all of you, sometimes you do things out of a very good heart. Yeah, you do an act of generosity, you give something to somebody, or you say some beautiful words to somebody. Oh, I really appreciate your uh, companion. Maybe you say it to a work colleague. Yeah, oh, I really appreciate you being my colleague. Yeah, yeah? Or, or something beautiful like that, when you really kind of, you come from, coming from your heart and you say something powerful. Yeah? And then you notice the feeling inside of you that arises with that kind action. And what you will see, it feels so beautiful. Yeah, it feels so wholesome. It feels so good. There's something very, very noble about that thing. And you can know it straight away inside of you. This is a noble attitude. This is, a, you know, this is the way I should live. It feels spiritual. It feels something that gives you a sense of self-worth. You feel really good about yourself when that happens. So please notice that, because when you are noticing that, uh, what you are seeing is what the Buddha called the Diteva Dhamma Kamma, the Kamma that you are creating in this very life. You can see the connection between your good intention and how you feel about yourself. Uh, that is Kamma, connection between intention and how you feel. Uh, and you can see that straight away. Uh, 
very, very powerful way of understanding this idea of suffering and happiness, yeah? The first noble truth, knowing the effect of your own actions in this way. Yeah? But it doesn't stop there. Because one of the things that also becomes quite obvious when you do this is that if you do many good actions, yeah, uh, again and again and again in this way, and this is a very important part of the Buddhist path, as you do that, you are accumulating this goodness. And as you are accumulating this goodness, you are effectively lifting up your mind, or you are not really lifting up your mind, but you are allowing your mind to soar. Yeah, that's what happens with the mind. You build up the helium in the balloon and the mind soars up. Yeah, you feel light, you feel bright, you feel really good about yourself. A kind of wholesome, good-hearted goodness it does not feel like ego at all. It feels like something very wholesome inside of you. So you are accumulating these things. And that is where you really start to understand that this is a path. It's not just an individual action. It is the path that lifts you out of the mire, lifts you out of the swamp of ordinary existence into something brighter, more beautiful and powerful. Sounds good, right? <laughs> and this is right view because you see it for yourself. You can feel it happening. Yeah, it's, this is kind of right view. You are actually understanding something about suffering and happiness, how to deliver happiness in your own life and how to avoid suffering. Yeah. There's, of course, there's also the other side of the coin, yeah, that you, when you do this, you will, you can also see the effects of your bad actions. Yeah, I would prefer, I would recommend you to look at the effect of your good action because it's more encouraging. Yeah, it kind of feels, you know, it's more uplifting in a sense to look at the positive side of things rather than look at the negative side of things. But it can also be helpful to look at your bad actions and see how it affects your mind. And you will inevitably see if you are sharp and you can see the connection again, that it tends to drag you down. It has the opposite effect. It kind of mires you more into that swamp of the world and you can't really, you get more sticky and more kind of holds you down in a, in a, in a sense. Uh, yeah, and these are the things that you can see here. So this is uh, what you, uh, a very simple way of thinking about right view and morality and how they work together in this way here. So, um, uh, and because of course it then accumulates, you can start to understand why this must also affect your rebirth. Yeah, because if you, obviously if you die with a bright mind, then that bright mind is what you carry with you into the future. And you can see how this whole process then kind of carries on in this way. Yeah. And what, one of the things that you learn from this, this is one of those little beautiful little stories that you find in the suttas. Uh, one of the things that you learn is that if you want to be kind to yourself, if you want to be your own friend, you have to be kind to others. And this is the story of the, uh, one of the great kings at the time of the Buddha, King Pasenadi of Kosala, very famous king. Anyone who has read the few suttas will have come across King Pasenadi. And uh, he would often go to the Buddha, yeah, and they would have discussions. And there's a whole chapter in the Sangyutta Nikaya, the connected discourses of the Buddha, which are just discussions between the Buddha and King Pasenadi. And they are often quite sweet little discourses. Yeah? One of the discourses is where the Buddha gives some, uh, uh, gives uh, a weight loss advice to the king. Yeah? Yeah? Have you, did you know that the suttas had weight loss adv adv advice? Were you aware of that? Yeah? It's quite interesting, isn't it? <laughs> so if you want to use the Buddha's kind of weight loss, then maybe you can, you can check it out in the suttas and see what you, what you think about it. Uh, it's very, <laughs> it's, uh, anyway, so I'll, I'll leave that for now. But it's kind of, uh, we can see how the Buddha, the spiritual teacher, just like now, they get called upon to answer all kinds of questions. Yeah, this is just the way it is to be a spiritual teacher. Uh, and I'm sure Venerable Chanda has, has also uh, recognized that. Uh, and uh, because and I suppose that in many ways, everything in the world is connected to the spiritual realm. Yeah, there's a good way of doing it and a bad way of doing it. So it's kind of understandable in a certain way. Uh, anyway, there's lots of little sweet little discourses like that uh, yeah, in the uh, Kosala Sangyutta. But on one occasion, uh, this King Pasena, the Kosala, he goes to the Buddha and he says to the Buddha, he says to the Buddha that those people uh, who treat others uh, uh, with who are who are moral in the world, they are their own friends, and those people who are immoral in the world, they are their own enemies. 
Yeah, and then the Buddha looks at him and he says, wow, that's pretty good, actually. Uh, I, I don't think he says that, but, you know, it, that's kind of sort of, been, sort of, you know, in the um, kind of background there. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, you exactly right what you're saying. Those who live morally, those who treat other people well, who treat other people with kindness, uh, they are the ones who are their own friends in the world. Uh, and you can see now how that makes sense, yeah? Because uh, as I mentioned before, when you are kind, uh, you can feel the result right here in this life. Uh, you actually feel better about yourself, uh, yeah? So you are treating, you are acting as your own friend because friends want to make uh, themselves, make the friends more happy. So you're treating yourself with friendship. Uh, and in the same way, if you treat others badly, if you treat others with uh, lack of kindness or whatever, you're treating yourself like your own enemy because enemies want to hurt their enemies and then you are hurting yourself. So you are hurting yourself means you are treating yourself like your own enemy. So you can see how this works. So be your own friend in the world. Yeah, and remember that the way to be your own friend is to treat everyone in the world with kindness and care and compassion and understanding and all of these positive things. And as you do that, you're actually being your own friend as well as, of course, the friend of those people too. And this is so such a simple but beautiful way of thinking about life. So again, this is just the ways of thinking about things to establish uh, this right view or right way of thinking about life uh, so as to enhance our ability to practice this path. Uh, there's another thing which comes to mind now because I was just doing a funeral ceremony uh, yesterday, yes, yesterday and the day before actually. And um, when you do funeral ceremonies, it's actually a very, I really like funerals. Does anyone else like funerals over there? Maybe, yeah, I really enjoy funerals. They're really cool times. They're cool because there's something very solemn about a funeral ceremony. People are usually more peaceful and calm than they usually are, yeah? It's like a serious occasion for most people, except for Ajahn Brahm, of course. He will tell you to tell a joke at a funeral, but uh, most people don't do that. It's like a solemn occasion. Yeah? So uh, you... What that means is that people are more open to the Dhamma. You can talk about Dhamma in a different way and you can tell some stories and you can talk about things in a different way. And, and death has this ability to bring reality into view and to see things more clearly. And of course, the, that reality is also an aspect of right view. And one of the stories I usually tell at these funeral ceremonies is a story which apparently uh, Lumput Shah, Ajahn Shah, used to tell her, yeah? And uh, of course, Ajahn Shah, when in his heyday, he was the teacher of large, large, large groups of people. And from the kind of, you know, the, the posh people in Bangkok to the local rice farmers, yeah, it's kind of amazing. Around Ajahn Shah, all of these people that belong to completely different, uh, you know, strata of society, they all came together because he spoke to everyone on an equal level. And the end of the day, we're all human beings. We all have the same problems. We all have the same issues we want to deal with. So why shouldn't we come together? And that's what happened. And of course, then there were all the foreigners that would visit him. Yeah? And sometimes there would be professors from university and all of these things who wanted to try to understand what these forest monks are about. And then, of course, then there, so there was a very kind of international and very sort of interesting audience for some of these talks. And one of these talks that he gave, which has kind of come down as famous, at least to me, because Ajahn Brahm tells this story. He tells a story of when Ajahn Shah takes, has a glass, take, lifts up a glass in his hand. Yeah, and he tells his audience when he lifts up the glass, he shows the audience the glass and he says, can you see the crack in this glass? No, we cannot see the crack. Lumpur what do you mean there's a crack in that glass? And he says again, can you see the crack in this glass? And uh, after a while, the audience obviously understands he's onto something here. There's something, something is going to happen. You know, some, there's some, some kind of hidden message behind this. They can't see it. Okay, you know, please let us know what, what is going on here. So Ajahn Shah said, well, um, the crack here signifies the idea of impermanence. Yeah, impermanence is always going to be there. This glass is not, uh, we know that this glass, one day the nature of a glass uh, is to fall to the ground, maybe on a concrete floor or a tiled floor. Uh, 
And when it falls on a concrete floor and a tiled floor, it will break into a thousand pieces. This is the nature of a glass. Eventually, that's usually what happens to most glasses. Yeah. So there is a crack in this glass in the sense that we know that it is inherently impermanent, inherently unreliable. We know that it was, must break one day. So what does that mean? What does it mean when something is inherently impermanent, when something is inherently fragile? A glass is very fragile. What does that mean? Well, what it means is that we care for the glass. We put it down gently. We put it down on a soft, something soft, yeah, not something hard. And we look after it. We put it away in a cupboard somewhere where it is kind of safe from falling out. So we look after the glass. We care for it because we know it is fragile. In the same way, human life is fragile. This is one of those astonishing things that you realize as a monastic, how fragile our existence is. People die sometimes left, right and center. You know, we have thousands of disciples down here in Perth and around the world and people die all the time and they die at any age for no apparent reason sometimes. It is so fragile. These bodies are so complex. Yeah, little thing goes wrong and bang, that's it. You had it. It's so uncertain, so unreliable. So what does that mean when the body is so fragile? It means that we start to care for the people around us uh, because we don't know how long they're going to last. Uh, we know they might just you know, drop dead the next moment. Uh, maybe this is the last time you see me. Could be, maybe because I die, yeah. I don't know if I got anything, any kind of cancers or things in here. Quite possibly there is something going on. Uh, but so what do we do? Well, maybe, when we remind ourselves of these things is that we care a little bit extra. We have a little bit more time for each other. We listen a little bit more deeply. Yeah, we don't kind of brush it, we don't rush around in life quite so fast. If you're gonna die this evening, are you gonna rush around to your next appointment? Probably not, yeah, you're probably gonna take it more easy. Okay, who cares about an appointment? I'm gonna die anyway. Well, we're always gonna die. We should never really rush around too much. This idea of death is so powerful. If we remember the fragility of life, we always take more care. We become more moral. We become kinder human beings. And this, again, is just one way of allowing this idea of right view to drive us in the right way, to think about things, think about the moral life, and, and live in a good way. So uh, uh, those are two uh, little ways of kind of enhancing your ability uh, to be moral. These are right view. You may wonder whether death is part of right view, why I'm bringing up the idea of death. But remember, when the Buddha gives the first noble truth yeah, uh, of suffering, one of, the, one of the first thing he says in that noble truth is that death is suffering. Yeah, Birth is suffering, old age is suffering, illness is suffering death is suffering. So it is right there in right view. Death is actually a very important aspect of what we uh, mean by right view in Buddhism. So uh, those are just a couple of ideas for you to uh, reflect on in terms of how to think about just right view in a very ordinary way. To me, this kind of right view is probably the most important kind of right view. <laughs> because it's so practical, yeah? It applies to every one of us. It is not so many people who end up becoming stream mentor arahants. It's nice to hear about those views as well, because it's nice to kind of have some idea of where we are heading, but it's not as practical. But these simple ideas of right view are actually really, really practical, because it's something that we all can apply right here and right now. So see if you can take some strange, the kind of the, the kind of dichotomy we have with other people. On the one hand, they are the people who are most important to us, uh, people, yeah? And on the other hand, they're also the ones that create the most suffering. It's this complicated relationships that we have with, uh, with people in the world. Uh. So how do we deal with other people if they are difficult? And one of the kind of very important Buddhist ideas of wrong view, oh, sorry, of right view, don't go wrong view, go right view. One of the very important ones is the idea that we are completely conditioned as human beings, uh, yeah? What we are, what our personality is, how we have been formed, the person you are now is a sum total of all the conditions that have worked on you in this life and also on past lives. Uh, 
And once you understand that, it's a very simple idea, but once you understand that, if someone treats you in the bad, wrong way, does the wrong thing towards you, remember, they are conditioned to be like that. They are only expressing the conditioning that has happened to them over a very, very long period of time, and they don't really have much choice. Yeah, You are unfortunate. You were in the wrong place at the wrong time. It's got nothing to do with you at all, the fact that they are being difficult or whatever. It has only to do with them. It is never personal. It is about the other person and their conditioning. Quite likely, they want to be Kind. Yeah, I think deep down we all want to be kind in one way or another because we know that kindness works, kindness is good, it feels right, but they cannot be kind. Yeah, think about yourself. Are you always able to be kind? Are you always able to think the right thought? And the answer is no. And the reason why it is no is because you're not in charge of yourself. If you were able to, the only way you can always be kind is if you are 100% in charge of yourself. And of course you are not. And that shows you how conditioned each one of us is. So remember that. This is such a simple idea. We are all conditioned to be the way we are. And when you remember that, ultimately, if you keep on building up that right view, this is also very powerfully about right view, there comes a point when you very rarely get angry with people because you realize it's not, it is very useless and it's pointless. Instead, they deserve compassion. They deserve compassion because they are conditioned to do things that goes against their own well-being and their own, own future happiness. And then you are on the right track. But um, let us move on to uh, the idea, the next stage on the path, yeah, the idea of meditation practice instead. And uh, uh, this is what I was talking about at the very beginning when I was talking about Ajahn Brahm, yeah, who then goes and he has this kind of, he meditates, whereas other people meditate that don't have the same results. Uh, and Ajahn Brahm says that he just renounces, he just gives things up, yeah, nekama, duk, or everything gone, and other people try, and it doesn't work, yeah, so how does this happen, how does actually this idea of renunciation occur in such a way that we can do a similar thing to what Ajahn Brahm does, and the way, one of the most important ways that it occurs is to understand the limits of the world around us, the sensory world around us, that things that stream in through our senses at all times, uh, understanding the limits of that. And the more we understand the limits of the sensory world, uh, the more ability we have to let go of that world because we know it is also suffering ultimately. Uh, yeah, if you go back again, I was saying before that we look at the Four Noble Truths as the basic idea of understanding reality. This is the definition of right view. The first one of those four noble truths is the idea of suffering. If you look at that definition of suffering, one of the things it says is that not getting what you want is suffering or getting what you don't want is suffering. Yeah, And this is what the sensory world is like. It is really a lot of the time about not really getting what we want. It is uh, inherently if you like, uh, unsatisfactory. Uh, and now, right now, is a very good time to contemplate that, uh, yeah? Because right now we are, I don't know about you, but this looks to me that when I look at the world, I think, oh, the world is doing all kind of weird stuff. Uh, yeah, we have the COVID thing. A lot of people seem to be very traumatized by COVID. In the monastery, we are really happy about COVID, yeah? Because things are more peaceful uh, and quiet. Uh, uh, not so many people coming around, so we are kind of, uh, we are kind of cheering COVID on a little bit. We have to do it quietly, otherwise people think we are nuts. But, uh, you know, so, sometimes in the, as in the monastic life, you see things very differently because your life is so different. Uh, but people are traumatized by it, and you can see why, because it upsets their life a lot. Maybe some of you have been traumatized by it as well, uh, and you certainly have my sympathy because I understand that it can, it is traumatizing when your life is turned upside down. Uh, so we have the COVID situation, we have kind of climate change, yeah, which is going really up the agenda these days and looking kind of worse and worse all the time. And again, you wonder where is the world going to go with these things? What is happening? You know, what is happening to the next generation? 
okay, maybe I will be okay because I'm getting so old now anyway. It doesn't really matter so much anymore to me. I'll probably be fine. But what about the next generation? Uh, what about all the next generation of Buddhists or whatever? Uh, wh where is all of this going? It doesn't look very good. And then you have the political situation around the world. Yeah, it kind of seems unstable and uncertain. Uh, we're all kind of funny leaders and, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, I don't need to mention any names. I'm sure you have your own kind of... Uh, a favorite or lack of favorite leaders, whatever they are. But it all seems very, yeah, very kind of unreliable. And remember that when these things happen in your life, and this is all about the external world around us, it is an opportunity for insight. It is about how we use these situations is far more important than the actual fact of these situations. So how do we use the situations? We start to understand that this is the nature of this external world. It will always be give us these kind of nasty surprises. This is the way it goes. Yeah, it has to be this way. I was just going, I went to a house dana today. I went to someone's house to have lunch. And usually I have a bit of dhamma discussion when I go there. And one of the young girls who was there, she was only 18 years old. And she, she asked me, well, how do you, deal with disappointment uh, yeah it's a good question yeah because it, it's obviously very applicable to everyone so how do you deal with disappointment and i said to her you get used to it uh, yeah because it's going to happen again and again and again uh, and when you get used to the idea of disappointment uh, the world starts to look less interesting here yeah? and when the world looks less interesting because you know it will always disappoint you uh, there will always be another covid there will always be another a terrible political leader, there will always be all of these things going on ad infinitum into the future, you become less interested in that world. And that lack of interest in that world means right view. Yeah, it means that you can let go of that world because when you understand that that world is not interesting, you withdraw inwards instead. And that is where you start to find your happiness and strength in the spiritual life, in the meditation, in the mind, in living in this way. So it becomes a blessing in disguise. Yeah? And the, so this life has so many blessings in disguise. It's like the, you know, the Ajahn Brahm story of good, bad, who knows? Uh, what is really bad in the long run? Well, it depends on the individual. Is COVID bad? Well, it is neither good nor bad. It depends how you react to it, whether it's good or bad. Uh, is climate change good or bad? That too, actually, yeah, it depends on how you react to it, whether it's good or bad. Uh, for many people, it is bad because they react in a way that is not conducive to anything positive. But for those of us who use these things well, actually, it's going to be a positive influence in the long run. Good, bad, who knows? It really depends on how you deal with these issues. So this is the message. This is the thing we should learn from this. Yeah? Learn about the uncertainty of the world outside. Learn about the limits of sensory existence and sensory experience. And as we do that, we turn towards spirituality. Meditation starts to work. You sit down, you don't do anything, and your mind automatically inclines towards peace, towards giving up, towards the breath. And that, that is actually what you enjoy. And then you start to understand what Ajahn Brahm is talking about. Just chill. Now I understand what just chill means. It means relax, and the mind goes in the right place. That is what it means. So this is the right way of thinking about this. And there is a lot in the Buddhist suttas about how to deal with the sensory world around us, how to think about it in the, in the right way. And I'll just tell you one little favorite sutta of mine. One of the, some of the suttas, I, I tell them all the time because I, I like them so much. But this one favorite sutta of mine is about this monk called Samidhi. And this monk, Samidhi, he is uh, bathing somewhere. It is the, the famous hot springs in, uh, uh, near Rajagaha. And if you travel to India today, you go to Rajagaha, those hot springs are still there. And the in local Indians are still bathing in those hot springs two and a half thousand years later. <laughs> That's kind of cool, isn't it? Uh, you go to India, you read the suttas, the bathing in hot springs, and you go there and it's exactly as if it were the suttas. Uh, it's just really amazing. Except, of course, it's a bit more developed, yeah, because now they have tiles and they have all that kind of stuff. Obviously, they didn't have tiles at the time of the Buddha, but the same idea after two and a half thousand years. Uh, I find that really cool. And it's not in India like that. It's kind of 
has this eternal feeling about it, India. Nothing has changed for two and a half thousand years. When you look at some of the buildings falling apart, they look about two and a half thousand years old. <laughs> well, not quite, you know, if you know what I mean. But everything looks ancient over there. Huh? And uh, so this monk, Samidhi, he's bathing in these hot springs. Yeah, and after coming out and he's kind of drying himself and he's standing there in one robe, then this devata comes down. And this devata, it doesn't say whether it's a male or female deva, but it, the story becomes more interesting if it's a female deva, yeah, because it creates this tension. A lot of Buddhism is about temptation, yeah, just like because, you know, one of the problems is always to kind of uh, overcome the sensual world and move towards the experience of the mind. This is obviously one of the difficulties. So, temptation of young monastics obviously is an important thing. So, if you think of this as a young female deva, the kind of the it makes the situation more um, potent, if you like, or more powerful. So she comes down and she takes a look at Samidhi and she says to Samidhi, wow, you are young, you know, in the prime of life, really good looking. And why are you wasting your time with the spiritual life? Yeah, this spiritual life which takes so long before, it, I'm just paraphrasing a bit now, the spiritual life which takes so long before it gives results. You keep on meditating and when do the results come? You have no idea when this nirvana or jhanas and when they will arrive, it's all in the future. But the sensual pleasures, they are available now. Come disrobe, forget about this silly, you know, idealistic, you know, um, spiritual life. Instead, become a householder, enjoy sensual pleasures, find a nice wife and just enjoy yourself. And uh, it's very fascinating. And she is basically saying, well, the sensual pleasures, they are available now. You just have to go out there, get the food, get the wife, get the entertainment, and bang, it's all available to you. Whereas this kind of spiritual life, who knows when it will arrive? Yeah, when the results will arrive. <laughs> so what do you think? Is that right? And there, it's fascinating, yeah, because when you think about it, you think, yeah, maybe the deva is right, yeah, actually, it's a good point, the sensual pleasures are available now, yeah, just have to go to the fridge or I go to my computer and, you know, turn on the whatever, and entertainment, and it's all there, but the spiritual life, you know, she has a point, you know, I meditate and all I do is fall asleep or think, yeah, maybe this, maybe I should give up these robes, yeah, what, what am I, maybe I'm wasting my time, yeah. It's a fascinating because it seems on the surface of things, it seems true, yeah, that that is how things are. But of course, it is not really correct. And the reason why it is correct is actually very profound and very interesting. Yeah? And it says something about the sensory world. Yeah? And it is not correct because the sensory world is always about the future, yeah? is always about craving, is always about moving on to something else. Yeah? Have you noticed that in your sens sensory life of existence? It's always about kind of heading towards somewhere else, some new entertainment, something new kind of pleasure, a new house, a new car, a new relationship, a new religion. Well, a new religion doesn't really come in. <laughs> but all of these things is always about the future. Craving is always about the future. And when you live a sensory existence, Craving is always there as part of that existence. You're never actually in the present moment. So the devata was actually wrong. The sensual pleasures are not available right here and now because they are never available here and now. They are always in the future. Whereas the spiritual life, if you live it right, yeah, if you succeed in being kind, if you succeed in being generous, if you succeed in finding a bit of peace in your meditation practice, you enjoy that experience right away, right here and now. Straight away, you feel, wow, this is so nice. Yeah? It's only a matter of finding that trigger, understanding it in the right way, and then the happiness comes as a consequence. That is the difference. This is the right view. So instead of always searching in the future, always moving on to something else, this is another aspect of this right view. Come to the only place where you can find happiness in the present moment, uh, eventually building up, building up, building up. Uh, and of course, in meditation, ultimately, you can find the highest kind of happiness in the present moment where there's no future or past, completely gone, uh, and all you experience is bliss. Uh, yeah? And that is where you actually find essentially 
the meaning of life itself. Because if you experience full bliss in the present moment, that is synonymous, at least temporarily, with finding the meaning of life because there's no more craving, there's no more desire. You're not going anywhere. That is the definition of having found the meaning of life. So, yeah, this is just a, it's, it's an interesting little story because it is like a little paradox. It's like a little koan almost, yeah? We don't have koans in Theravada Buddhism. This is maybe as close as we come to a, a Theravada koan. I've got to be careful now what I say because ter- maybe someone won't like the idea of Theravada koans, but it's kind of a cool idea. So like a Theravada koan almost. Uh. So this is how you gradually learn to let go of the world outside uh. You understand its limitations. You understand how it will always disappoint you. It will never give you what you want. Yeah? It will always promise things, but the promise is always empty. Yeah? It doesn't actually deliver the goods. Yeah? And that is why you get upset when you see the news. Yeah? That is why you get upset when you see about climate change. Yeah? That is why uh, relationships always, in one way or another, they must end in a, in a problematic way, either because people die or because of breakup or because of whatever. Yeah? And this is the nature of that world. So you draw inside, uh, you let go of that world. uh, And this is how you gradually build up that right view within her. It's very powerful, these things, you know, and they are very profound. And I don't know if you're able to understand and see these things properly, but I'm sure most of you, maybe all of you are able to see some of this. uh, Yeah, that there must be some truth to what I'm saying here because uh, it is just so obvious when you think about it. uh, But to build it up, allow it to come over time. None of these things happen straight away. There are ideas that you build up in your mind. You change your view gradually over time. And gradually, 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 you are deepening your meditation by thinking in this way. So whenever you have a problem in life, think of it as an opportunity. And then you are thinking in the right way. So what we do all of these things, and then eventually we come to the point where our meditation is really going very, very well, and things are really coming together. And there comes a point when the real right view that frees starts to come into focus. It starts to become a possibility. So let me just very, very briefly, in a couple of minutes, talk about that final right view that happens when we become stream enters, when we see the Dhamma. One of the complicated things about the Buddhist teaching, one of the things that seems to be, it seems like we are trapped in samsaric existence, uh, yeah, is a very beautiful teaching. It's a teaching that that was mentioned by Venerable uh, Chanda before. And this is the problem that uh, uh, our mental, our mental, the way we think about the world, uh, the way that our mind works, uh, we are trapped actually in a certain outlook and that outlook is the idea of a self and the suttas explain this that when you have a certain perception of the world yeah then that drives your thinking because you perceive the world in a certain way it drives your thinking process now that thinking process in turn when it consolidates and it becomes a you know a, a has a certain direction it drives our views yeah, how we, how we think about the world. And those views, in turn, they determine our perceptions, which determine our thought, that determine our views, determine our perceptions, thought, views, perception, thought, views, round and round and round. And it looks like there is no escape because it's like everything is conditioning each other. So what is the problem? Why is it that these things condition each other in this way? And we are trapped into this kind of circular wrong view driving itself on. And the thing behind all of this is the sense of self, yeah, that I exist, that I am somebody. This is the problem behind all of this. And this is what drives this process going round and round. So the really deep view that frees you ultimately, once you have used the view in the right way to become a better person, then to find deep, satisfying, blissful meditation experiences. And then eventually you come to the point where now you're ready for the big insights. The big insight that you get at this point is when you see that all of these things are problematic and suffering. Not only the world outside is problematic and suffering, but actually it is also true of the world inside. And when you see that, uh, at that point, uh, you're able to let go of the delusion of a self because the delusion of a self needs a place within where it finds happiness that it hangs on to as permanent and happy. If you see that that 
doesn't actually exist, there is no such thing inside, it is all impermanent and changing, then bang, that view of the self is abandoned inside her. And when that view of the self is abandoned inside, then you break the cycle. Huh? And suddenly you gain this profound view of reality. It is like a revolution in consciousness. Huh? When suddenly you see the world in an entirely new way, upside down from what it was before. Huh? Yeah? It's like a 180 degree change in view. And that is what stream entry is all about, this sudden shift in reality and there is no sense of self anymore the sense of self the view that there is a self is gone and because of that you no longer seek for happiness in the wrong place and now at that point you have internalized the noble eightfold path you have internalized right view yeah this is the really the right view that frees you up entirely and because you have internalized all of these things you are incapable of thinking about the world in the wrong way then gradually all of this works itself out and it works itself out until eventually you reach the full enlightenment itself. So that is just a very brief view of the higher ideas of right view. I, I personally, I find the more ordinary ideas of right view to be more interesting because they are more practical. They are things that we can apply right now. I think often when we teach about right view in Buddhism, we say right view is rebirth and karma. And of course it is those things, but it is much more subtle than that. What does it actually mean when we talk about karma and rebirth? And those things that I've been talking about today are really the, uh, you, you draw out the information from these things. You make it more clear what these things actually imply so that you can use them in your life to enhance your life enhance your kindness, your morality, uh, your support of everyone around you, uh, your compassion, all of these things, uh, and then really make the path work for you, uh, because this is uh, the foundation of the spiritual path. Uh, get right view right, uh, get right view right, yeah, get right view right, and then everything comes as a consequence. Uh. Okay, so there you are, that's my little Dhamma talk for you, so I hope, I hope you're okay with that. Uh, and uh, if you're not, then <laughs> I don't know what to say if not. So please uh, carry on, Venerable uh, Chanda and Derek, whatever you want to do next time. Okay. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> so now is the time for some Q&A. So we have quite a few questions here. So are you happy to take some of those, Ajahn? I can read them out. Absolutely. You. Fire away, as I say. Yeah. All right. So James says that he worries that the more I turn my mind to spiritual practice, the more I become isolated from ordinary life. This has caused me problems in the past before I was a meditator, as I failed to change my life for the better and become apathetic. I'm not a monastic. I have things I need and want to do in ordinary life. How do I avoid becoming apathetic to ordinary life concerns when I spend more time turned towards the spiritual life? Okay, but what, do you, what you have to do is you have to integrate your ordinary life into the spiritual path. Yeah? You have to remember that ordinary life is actually a possibility to grow spiritually if you use it in the right way. Sometimes people think that they want to get the ordinary life out of the way, the job, the family, and all of these things, so they can focus 100% on the spiritual path. But uh, that is, I don't think that is the best way of dealing with it, uh, because we have our responsibilities. And as you say, you want to do things in the ordinary world. So remember, it is an opportunity to uh, practice spiritually in your ordinary life, at least to some extent, as long as you don't overdo it. Uh, because that is where kindness comes out. That is where our care for our co-human beings come out. That is where compassion comes out. How we treat and how we deal with the people around us. So, yeah, so see whatever it is that you do in ordinary life. See it as an opportunity for spiritual growth. See it as an opportunity for being generous. Yeah, it is, I, so often we take each other for granted. And I can see that even in the monastic life, it take my fellow monastics for granted. Yeah, take Venerable Chanda for granted. Oh, yeah, and another email from Venerable Chanda. I don't get that many emails from Venerable Chanda at all. So I'm just, I'm just messing around by making an example. But you know what it's like, yeah? And 
actually, no, what I want to do, I want to write a nice email to Venerable Chanda. How can I compose something that is friendly and nice to, to her rather than just kind of say, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, I'll be there, see you, you know, bye-bye, or something kind of superficial and, and not coming from the heart or anything like that. And I try my very best. Sometimes I forget too. Everyone forgets sometimes, but I try it. When I write something, when I say something, I try to put something into it. I try to put kindness into it. Uh, yeah. And uh, even in monastic life, that can be a challenge. And certainly, I recognize it can be a challenge in lay life, but that is a challenge that you need to take. Uh, make it spiritual, integrate it into your path. Don't dichotomize these things. Uh, and then you will be on the right track and you will also enhance your spiritual practice at the same time and your meditation and all of that. Uh. Great. I have to say, Ajahn Pumali, that your emails are always very uplifting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's good. Yeah. The integration works. Okay. The next is from Samantha. She's asking, if karma conditions one, one's next birth, what role does the last thought moment play at death? Is it true that even having done good karma in most of one's life, if the last thought at death happens to be not good, then what would one be reborn according to that thought and not the karma? Yeah, this is one of those uh, classical uh, Theravada questions, yeah, and uh, it arises out of uh, what I would call the, uh, the Theravada Abhidhamma. Theravada Abhidhamma has this idea that when you die, yeah, it's called the, the, it's called the death moment, called the Chutta Chitta, Chutta Chitta, Chutta means kind of passing away, Chitta is mind, so it's a passing away mind, then you have the Patisandhi Vinyana, which is the connecting consciousness and there's nothing in between you go straight from one life straight on to the next one and that is i think that is where this idea of death moment importance comes from because if the very last moment you die is a bad one and then you get reborn straight away obviously it's going to have an effect yeah but uh, i don't think that way of looking at life and death actually is according to reality. I don't think it is even according to the suttas. It is a misunderstanding of how things work. And uh, there is such a thing as an intermediate life, an antra bhava. There is, is a time period yeah, from the moment you die to the moment you get reborn again. And uh, we know this also from you know many, a lot of you know, near-death experiences seem to point in the same direction. You go to some realm, yeah, and it, then you can't cross over a certain boundary. Once you cross over a certain boundary, you can't come back again. But in the meantime, it seems like you can even come back. So there is something there going on, which is in between. And once you have this idea of something in between, then obviously the death moment is not so important anymore, right? Because there's something that takes a while before your karma ripens, if you like. And that, what happens in that intermediate period, the, the antra bhava, is that you uh, have a bit of time to reflect, uh, you have a bit of time to think back on your life, you have an overview, you, know, you may know that it's quite common for people to have life reviews, yeah, during the death moment, you have a sudden death experience or whatever, you have a life review, and you kind of summarize your own life, and then you judge yourself. And if you have lived well, as you say, making lots of good karma, you will judge yourself well. And whatever bad thought moment you had the moment you died will be gone. Yeah, it won't be there anymore. Huh? So uh, I think it is all really silly. And I think we can make a mistake by, you know, maybe trying too hard when we die to have the right kind of mind yeah when you try really hard you tend to mess it up yeah oh no i must not be angry no go away thought oh no don't think that what no not now boom and you're dead <laughs> and then you <laughs> you messed it up yeah and you tried too hard to kind of do the uh, do something which cannot really be done you cannot control your mind in that way huh? So uh, much better to relax into the death experience and just enjoy the ride, yeah? And then as you do that, then uh, even if there is some uh, unwholesome thought towards the very end, uh, it's not really gonna be all that uh, uh, problematic. As long as you have done lots of good karma, you have lived well, that is what is gonna decide where you go next. Okay. Thank you, Ajahn. So let's see. We have a lot of questions coming in. I'm trying to start with the first people. Okay, 
Does meeting a difficult person mean some kind of karmic connection? Does this karmic connection get resolved if I see a difficult person through right view? Yeah. Um, the, does it mean a karmic connection? I, I, there isn't very much in the suttas about karmic connection. Yeah, it doesn't usually work like that. I, I, I would say it is more to do with habit. So we have met certain people in the past life that we have uh, kind of we hung out with and we enjoy the company. And very often when we meet them again in this life, there's a sense of shared past, yeah? a sense of shared <laughs> something. And then we kind of end up with them again. And sometimes we have uh, you know, shared past lives with difficult people. And some, it's very strange how sometimes people are attracted to people who are difficult. Yeah? You know what it's like, you hear, hear about people who marry, get married, or, hang, or, or have a relationship with people who are really, really difficult, and sometimes abusive, and, and, and all these kind of things, and yet somehow they can't really tear themselves away. It's as if there is a strong bond there, and that bond is often a bond of, I wouldn't say kamma, I would say it is just a habit, because kamma is really just the relationship between your intention and how you feel about yourself. It is not about the broader thing that we kind of hang out with specific people. Uh, that is, uh, is, a, is a different way of doing things. So. Um, but nevertheless, regardless of what it is, whether it's kamma or not, uh, I guess it is helpful to think of it as not kamma because then it makes it less uh, deterministic. Yeah, it, it actually is helpful. It is actually something you can do something with uh, because if it was kamma, maybe you couldn't do, do something. Uh, but you can, yeah? And uh, the opportunity with difficult people is always to, the first opportunity is always just to learn how to deal with them in the right way. Huh? And that is to understand that the reason they are difficult is because they can't be any other way. Huh? This is how they've been conditioned. Huh? And they probably don't want to be difficult at all. They want to be kind. They want to do the right thing. They can't stop themselves from being difficult. Huh? And once you get that, once you get that it's got nothing to do with you, you can start to have compassion for them. Yeah, they are trapped in that mind state, in that way of being. Yeah. Then you can have compassion. Yeah. So there's something very powerful going on here. But uh, at the same time, you have to know your own limitations. It's a very important point. Uh, just trying to be compassionate all the time and uh, uh, you know, allowing yourself to suffer in that kind of relationship is also not so good. You have to look after yourself as well. So you have to use kind of both strategies at the same time, both looking after yourself and also changing your attitude and trying to understand the other person with compassion. And when you get that balance right, then it becomes very powerful and it becomes a very uh, useful thing for, uh, you know, bringing your spiritual path forward, if you like. Yeah. Great. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we have another classic Buddhist question, Ajahn Mali. Um, mm. What is the reasoning of rebirth and karma going from one life to another? How can there be no self and yet a karma that goes from one life to the next? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that, this is a very typical question that you hear a lot. Yeah. Surely, surely, surely there's a case that if if there is rebirth, it must be a self, yeah, which takes you from one life to the next one. Surely that is the case. It is impossible to think of any alternative to that. But actually, there is an alternative to that. And this is what is so interesting. And this is exactly what makes the idea of dependent origination so profound. If there was a self going from one life to the next one, it wouldn't be so mysterious. It would be kind of, you know, understandable for most people. This is what makes it so profound and so interesting, yeah? That actually there is nothing going across, and yet the process keeps going. Yeah? And the reason why it keeps going is because of craving. Craving drives this process forward. Yeah? But um, take, take it back to this life, yeah? Look at this particular life. And if you look at yourself in this life, uh, you try to look for yourself who you are. Yeah? And if you look inside of yourself, uh, you won't see anyone there who is the real you in this life. Yeah, you look back 10 years or 20 years and you think, yeah, there are some things that have a carry on. There is a certain degree of continuity there. But if you look very deeply, you won't find any essential essence at the bottom of that continuity. That is true in this very life, yeah, now. And because it is true in this life, that is also what happens when you carry on from one life to the next one. 
The only thing that is different from one life to the next one is that your perception of the body is gone. The body kind of disappears in one life, but your mind is still there. The mind still has the same kind of momentum, the same th kind of thing that drives it on in this life will also drive it on into the future existence. Nothing has really changed as far as the mind is concerned. Yeah, so it kind of moves on into that one. And the craving propels you into the future. Yeah, this is what the craving does. The craving is something which uh, uh, has this driving ability. Uh, and that is what, uh, uh, what then carries you on into the future. Uh, and uh, there are various uh, similes that are sometimes used uh, to explain this. And uh, the, sometimes similes aren't entirely satisfactory because they don't really explain all the details for how this works. But uh, one of the similes that is used is a simile of a candle. Uh, yeah, so you, you have a candle burning and then you... Uh, you kind of, uh, you know, you, you uh, light another candle with that candle uh, and you ask yourself, what went across? Did anything really go across? Uh, well, not really, because it's just, uh, you're just lighting one candle with the other one and then the flame suddenly now exists on two candles, but nothing actually went across. Uh, this is one way of, of thinking about this. Uh, uh, so it is like another way of thinking about life, whether in this life or across lives, uh, is like a river, uh, yeah, a river of... Uh, ever-changing molecules in that river, but the shape of the river is kind of gradually changing. Yeah? The shape of the river kind of signifies the person. The changing in this life and changing when it goes from one life to the next one, this is the stream of consciousness moving on. But every moment of that river is different because every moment there's different molecules, but the shape of the overall shape of the river is only slowly changing. Your personality is only slowly changing. Yeah. We can see how people are often stuck with a similar personality in one life, maybe changing a little bit, but a large part of your character is the same across time. Whereas individual moments of mind are different all the time. So the simile of the river is quite a, quite a good one. But just in the end, just as there is nothing, no essence right here, right now in this life, in the same way, there is no essence that moves on from one life to the next one. Right, Ajahn from Mali, we have quite a lot more questions. Are you happy to keep going for a while? Or yeah, you... absolutely, yeah. yeah. Go for it. Yeah. Lovely, thank you. So I'll just try and find this one. Okay, from Michael. Referring to Ajahn Brahm and jhanas, it seems that paramis developed in previous lives are not very much taken into account, but that's also an important aspect that influences practice. One should not feel discouraged, but consider that whatever progress is made in practice in this life will be taken into the next life. And I guess he's wanting your input on that. Yeah, yeah. Yes, absolutely. No, that's a very, I think that's a very good point. Yeah, we all come into this life with different habits and different, you know, development from past life and all these things. I don't like the word parami myself because... Uh, parami is something that is taken from the bodhisattva ideal. Yeah, and the bodhisattva ideal is so commonly used in Buddhism, whether it's Theravada or Mahayana, that we always talk about paramis, but uh, it isn't, that is not how that word, the word actually exists in the early suttas, but is used in an entirely different way. Yeah. So I don't personally like the word so much, but the principle you're talking about is certainly, I, I agree with that, uh, that we develop in the past life, uh, then we bring those qualities into this life, and we're all very different. Some are super duper meditators straight away, Actually, some, that's an exaggeration, a tiny minority are super duper meditators straight away. And uh, some are, the majority are somewhere in between. Yeah, and then there are some who are really struggling a lot. Uh, and as you say, the mind is what we take from one life to the next one. Yeah, so if you develop your mind well in this life, uh, uh, you will have a good starting point and then you will carry on. Uh, hopefully, yeah, as long, as long as you don't kind of give up on Buddhism in your next life, uh, uh, hopefully you will carry on. Uh, and then, as you say, continue from there. So nothing is ever lost. Uh, sometimes people think that when you are reborn, you lose everything, yeah, and there's nothing to take with you. And that would be very disappointing. But that's not the way it goes. Uh, you take those qualities with you into the future, quite right. Great. Okay. Nayan is asking, if you accept the world will always disappoint and so focus more on the spiritual world, how do you address address the injustices of the world to make life better for those people suffering due to disappointments of the world, e.g. COVID, bad politics, etc. Yeah. 
you you still you still address the sufferings in the world, but you do it in a slightly different way. Yeah, so you don't have the delusion that you can fix all the problems in the world. You know that regardless of what you do, there will always be new problems. So it is very, one of the difficult things about being an activist is that they actually want to fix the world. They want to change the world. And when it doesn't work out, they get really disappointed and it feels really terrible. And then they get angry Then they take up weapons and they want to destroy it. Yeah? And this is often the outcome of that disappointment when we look at the world in the wrong way. So instead of um, thinking that we can actually change the world, uh, and of course the world is changeable to some extent. Yeah, it, it fluctuates. Sometimes the world is a bit better. Sometimes it is a bit worse. But our ability to change the world is very, very uncertain. And in the long, long run, in the really long run, the world just goes through cycles and cycles and cycles. And there is no solution in that realm. And that is what is so despairing. You know, one of the things about human thought, human thought, we have always tried to find utopias. Yeah, Marxism is a kind of utopia. Capitalism, I suppose, is a kind of utopia. And we love the idea of utopias because... A utopia is like a final solution to the problem, yeah? The problem of in social instability, the problem of unfairness. If you have a utopian society, you have solved all the basic problems. That's kind of the idea. But it doesn't work like that, uh, yeah? And the, because, and the reason why it doesn't work like that is because of human defilements. Uh, we always undermine our own social uh, structures by greed, by anger, by delusion. It just keeps on going on and on and on, round and round, the same problems re-arising here. Yeah? And when you see that, you get a bit uh, fed up. Yeah, you had a bit enough of this world. You know, it's just same thing again and again. I don't want to have anything to do with that anymore. Uh, so instead of thinking that you will actually solve things, uh, you are kind to people. You help out out of compassion instead uh, because you realize you can reach some people. Yeah, you can reach some, make somebody's life better. And you do it as part of your spiritual practice and not because of some grandiose, sometimes grandiose idea, a delusion that you're going to change the world. And then you are on the right track. Yeah? So right view helps you uh, both spiritually and also, I think, to have a more realistic idea of what you can do in the world. Uh, Venable, are you there? I think Venable <laughs> Sander has been kicked out of the room. Yeah. So I will ask the next question. Yeah. The next question is, in this time of COVID, a lot of people are displaced by travel restrictions. As time goes by, the expectation and the craving of being in the comfort zone of things going back to normal is there. Is this craving? The craving to have things go back to back to the sense of self. Are there any comments on this? Yeah, I, I, it, is, it is very natural to have that kind of craving, you know, and I, I, I'm, you know, it would be crazy to judge people for having that sort of craving. Of course, you can't judge people for that. It's very natural, but um, I think, remember the spiritual path is a very gradual path. So you learn things, you learn about the nature of the world, and you will see that your craving is the same as before, yeah? And uh, you keep on learning and gradually see your craving going down and you see your attachment to that world going down because you realize that uh, uh, after a while, you start to realize that it's no point in that craving, that attachment. Uh, so don't be surprised that you should crave for that. It is natural because so much of our life is lived in that world, yeah? Uh, almost everything we do is lived in the world of the five senses. Of course, we're going to be attached to that world. It would be, you almost have to be the Buddha not to be attached to that world. So if you're not the Buddha, you don't have to feel any bad about not uh, doing it. But still, gradually start to remind yourself of that world uh, and how unreliable it is uh, and how things are always liable to go wrong at, at a certain point. And as you remind yourself of that, Gently, don't try to go too fast. If you try to go too fast, you create too much suffering for yourself. Always be kind to yourself. Have compassion for yourself. You know, self-compassion is such an important thing in this world that sometimes we are way too hard on ourselves. Being hard on ourselves is no good. Be gentle with yourself. There's actually a point that I, I was going to make earlier on, but somehow it's, it slipped my mind. I was talking about the idea of not getting angry with others. And we should also not get angry with ourselves. We need to have self-compassion. 
We have to understand our own limits. We have to understand that when we slip up, when we make a mistake, it's okay. Yeah, okay, I'm fine. Yeah, everyone makes mistakes. It is not a big deal. Don't be hard on yourself. If you are hard on yourself, your chances of learning from your mistake is less. People take pride in being hard on themselves because they think they will learn something from it. No, it's the other way around. It is when you have self-compassion that you learn something. Why? Because your mind is more balanced. When you're hard on yourself, you become a bit angry and upset, and that uh, stops you from seeing what is actually going on clearly. If you want to see things clearly, have compassion on yourself. And the same thing with the, the world and having craving. Yeah, it is natural to have some craving for these things. So allow these things, take it slowly. Understand the limits of what you can do right here and right now and allow this shift to come over time in this way. So don't, don't, don't worry too much about that. Just try to see things gradually in the right way. Okay, Derek, you want to go for the next one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think maybe Venerable's back. Venerable Chandler, are you there? I'm not sure that I can be heard, actually. I can hear you. Oh, okay. So I'm on my tablet, but I can't see anybody's video. So I think if Derek could um, ask the question instead, that might work. Okay, so the next question then is, how can I know my limitations so that I don't practice too strictly or too lax, but stay on my personal middle path? Okay, so you just, uh, you just notice your reactions. Yeah, you notice reactions to things. Uh, and you notice that sometimes when you push yourself too much in meditation or you push your mind too much in any whichever way, you get a negative reaction, yeah? And it, it, it kind of drags you down. And uh, so you try to find that balance in your ordinary life. Um, one of the most important things is to try to use wisdom rather than willpower. We tend to use too much willpower in our spiritual life. Try to use wisdom instead. Try to think about things in a way so that the problems go, go away through thinking about things in the right way. So a, a, a typical example of that is that when you uh, find yourself in a difficult situation and you find yourself getting angry with somebody, try not to suppress the anger, but instead try to understand what is going on. And as you understand what is going on, as you see things quite clearly, you change your perspective on the other person and that change of perspective actually overcomes the anger, yeah? the sense of compassion and understanding. Uh, uh, for the other person. Uh, one of the main ways of knowing that you are heading in the right direction, especially in the long run, is just to look at your qualities. Uh, yeah? Are you growing in good qualities? Uh, are you becoming more gentle? Uh, are you becoming more kind-hearted? Uh, are your bad qualities, your ill will and negativity, are they going down? Yeah? Is your mindfulness getting established? When you go on a retreat, uh, are you finding that you are hanging out with your breath more, yeah, that all of these things are building up. And if you see this is happening in general over the long run, say over a period of six months or a year or something, then you know that you are on the right track. That is in kind of in the long term. So take a long term view because uh, from week to week, you know, it's just your moods might change or whatever. And, 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 and this is, is kind of unreliable. But if you have the long term view, then you have some uh, way and ability to judge whether you are heading in the right direction or not. Uh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> okay, I, there, there are a few more questions, but it's already past the, the time for today. So thank you very much, Ajahn Pramali. And I would like to now ask Mel if she wouldn't mind saying a few words about Dana. Oh, thank you, uh, Derek. Um, Arjun Bamali, thank you so much um, for very generously giving us your time and for the wonderful Dharma talk and all those answers to the questions. Um, and also to Venerable Chanda, who's kindly organised this session and who is working tirelessly to, to develop England's first monastery in the UK where women can train towards full bikini ordination. 
So today's session is offered on a donation basis um, in the spirit of generosity and any contribution you're able to make is very gratefully received and will help support Venerable Chanda's physical needs and the day-to-day -day running of our current residents in Oxford in the UK, as well as the wider aims of the Anakam Pabikuni project. Our success depends entirely on the generosity of people who value the sharing of the priceless Dharma. So we thank you for your ongoing support and generosity. You can find out more details about the project and how to donate on the Anicampa website. And I think one of the co-hosts, Leone, is kindly going to pop the link into the website into the chat box. So thank you all very, very much. In particular, um, uh, back, to, back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mel. And thanks to the team for taking over in my absence. <laughs> I'm sure it was much more seamless at your end than it was on mine. So that's wonderful. And of course, a great thank you from the heart to Ajahn Brahmali for being one of our super duper teachers that we're really privileged to have here and sharing his wisdom and Dhamma in such a practical way. So thank you very much, Ajahn Brahmali, for being here today. And um, I also wanted to mention that we've arranged a eight day retreat with Ajahn Brahmali and I'll be assisting that by giving some evening talks and uh, Q&A sessions. And that is from the 16th until the 23rd of May this year. So of course, because of the COVID um, pandemic, which has hit England and most of Europe pretty heavily, um, it won't be possible to invite him here as we had hoped, but he's very kindly offered to do that as a Zoom retreat. So um, you can find more about that on our website and Leonie's just popped in the link for you there. So really looking forward to that. We still have lots of places available. So I hope some of you can join. And um, I'd just like to hand back to Ajahn Bumali to say a last couple of words, if you would, Ajahn Bumali, before we can unmute everyone and wave goodbye. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, very nice to meet you, see you all. And uh, it is marvelous uh, to have someone like Venerable Chanda over there in England uh, trying to establish a monastery for nuns. It's a marvelous thing here. And it's a difficult thing to do. And I would... Uh, uh, and join you all to please uh, support her and help her out because it is going to be something which is going to be of great value for Buddhism. And if it's a great value for Buddhism, it's going to be of great value for so many people Yeah, in the UK, in England, in, in Europe and around the world and everywhere. So it's a marvelous thing that is happening. So I wish you all the very best of luck with your project, Venerable Chanda. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Ajahn Gaman. Okay. And uh, bye bye. We'll bye -bye.